when you're looking for locations and uh, of where to set uh, rain gardens on your homescape, consider natural flow patterns that aren't too low in the landscape. Like for instance, you see the back of the home here discharging water from the, the upper part of the, um, of the building on the, on the screen and the bottom part of the screen. You also have a deck off the back there. So considering um, views, view sheds, whether you want to block off a view um, if you're not getting along with your neighbor, um, or if you want to open up a view to a natural area, you can frame it in. So consider some of those um, design elements. In this um, setting, we've got the, the, uh, the ellipse down there representing where the rain garden location might be because right now a water sheet flows down to that location. So that's a good spot for it. If you zoom in close on that, where that ellipse is, this is a, a grading plan for that same rain garden. The dotted line on the bottom of the rain garden location cell, you can see there is the basin. It's completely flat and level. If you take your carpenter's level and set it down onto the finished grade of the rain garden floor, it won't break the bubble. And the idea is to spread the water out evenly. Um, when we were originally doing these, we a lot made them a lot of times V-shaped or bowl-shaped, but we run the risk then of having a really wet, saturated area for extended periods and then really dry areas over here. And we're not getting the same type of infiltration and evaporation that we would if we spread it out nice and evenly. So that uh, dotted uh, spot is the rain garden basin. The next line out is a solid line. That's the ponding depth. In this case, it's maybe six inches. Typically never exceeds 12 inches. Um, in clay soils, it might be down around four to six inches. In sandier soils, between six and 12 inches typically. Much deeper than that, you run the risk of extended uh, ponding. We don't want to go more than about 24 to 48 hours. Um, then you've got on the downhill side of the drawing a berm. So what you've done now that you've captured the water is created three different planting zones and this will help drive the, the planting process later. So you've got the really moist floor of the rain garden. Then on the side slopes you have moist to average conditions. Then on the berms you have dry conditions. So ultimately when you get to the point of selecting plants it's going to be driven not only by the exposure to light, maybe a little bit by the soil types, but especially by the, uh, the hydrology that you expect to see there. So keep in mind when selecting plants that moist down on the floor, moist to average, sometimes the term is mazic, um, and then dry in the upper part. Then you get to the fun part, which everybody wants to skip to right away, um, uh, which is the planting plan. And uh, one tip that I like to give people is select fewer species than you might at first be inclined to, to select plant bigger groupings and think about not only the blooming of the color but get some uh, texture and some height and diversity of structure in there. So I like to recommend doing about half grasses and sedges and shrubs to half flowers and that seems to be a pretty good balance of uh, structure. It's also more sustainable over the long term than a, a completely um, a perennial uh, flower bed. So a little bit now about the functions and the values of rain gardens. We talked uh, a lot about the types of rain gardens in the landscape and what some of the design elements are and what they might look like depending on your tastes or your goals. But regarding what they actually do in the landscape, it's an important point that I think we should probably touch on. So I'll talk a little bit about how our watersheds have been altered and how that affects uh, the ecology of the area in, in, in brief uh, fashion talk a little bit about how we can mitigate for our landscape impacts by using rain gardens. Um, and, you know, rain gardens have a couple of other neat effects that we don't uh, always think of, like groundwater recharge. Our drinking water supply in some areas is in, um, is in jeopardy of being depleted, and um, by infiltrating water we can recharge those systems for our, for our uh, children's children. Um, there's a lot of water smart landscaping benefits. Choosing the right plant for the right location means you're not watering, fertilizing, or herbiciding those plants, which means less pollutants and less water drawdown effects on our landscapes. There's certainly a large amount of aesthetic values um, that we see with rain gardens, which is one of the reasons why people want to put them in. And there's certainly um, some good habitat values for um, birds, butterflies, dragonflies, hummingbirds, etc. So a little bit about our landscape and how things have changed and why we might consider doing rain gardens. This is a map of the pre-settlement native plant community distribution in the seven county metro area in the mid to, 18, mid to late 1800s. Um, it's comprised of things like big woods and prairie and um, wetlands, etc. And um, all that's really left of that that hasn't really been impacted to any great degree are the areas you see left in purple here. 
And what has been replaced um, is uh, all of the functions that attenuate or pretty much almost virtually eliminate uh, stormwater runoff. Our plants um, basically provide about four principal ecological functions that eliminate runoff from happening in, in their systems, or all but eliminated. Um, they intercept water as it's falling from the sky. They help infiltrate water through their good root structure, keeping the soils loose. They evapotranspirate, or turn water into water vapor, put it back up to the atmosphere. Then whatever's left over is flowing through stems, above ground stem structure that slows water down, which drops a lot of the organic material and the pollutants that our, our landscapes collect between rain events. So by the time the water makes it to our lakes and our rivers and our wetlands, the rate has been reduced, the volume has been dramatically reduced, and the quality of the water making it to our water resources dramatically improved. So we've lost a lot of those functions by developing the land in the way we have in the last couple hundred years here in, in the Midwest. And what we've replaced it with are things like impervious surface. So as you look from a satellite photograph or a, 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 a plane photograph from the sky and look down across the landscape, and you look at um, how much impervious cover, or roads, parking lots, buildings, sidewalks, things we all need, um, but as you increase that percentage across the landscape of the cover um, from 10% up to 30%, 50, and then you get into a more urban area like downtown uh, St. Paul, Minneapolis, around 80%, um, a lot of things change pretty dramatically. The rate of water increases tremendously. The volume of water increases tremendously, and then the quality of the water leaving the system into our lakes and rivers is um, pretty, pretty cruddy. So um, again, when you look at, in the upper left cell, a natural ground cover, in worst case scenario, maybe 10% of the water falling from the sky is converted to runoff. In prairies, it's actually less than about a percent. Once you get down to um, the bottom right-hand side of the screen into an urban setting, the whole equation has flipped over. Instead of 50% of the water falling from the sky getting converted to drinking water eventually, or infiltration, now that 55% is being converted, 55 to 65%, to runoff. And that's important because as we uh, uh, work across the landscape, the landscapes collect a lot of debris, a lot of organic material, a lot of nitrogen and phosphorus, um, metals from our cars and our buildings, about a dozen or so, uh, petroleum products, herbicides, pesticides, fertilizers, you name it, um, build up on our landscape, especially things like grass clippings. Those go directly into catch basins in our gutter lines when the rain comes. And then that discharges most of the time directly into a stream or a wetland or a lake. And what that means over the landscape is that a lot of junk between rain events gets built up and until recently we weren't on the hook for um, handling a lot of that junk. We would worry more about flood control which is an important thing to consider. But now we're um, um, of the mindset where we have to now start to replace some of those old structures and augment some of the existing structures and not eliminate those flood control structures but supplement them. Give them a little help and not only to treat the uh, flood control uh, storm event, but also the rate and the volume and the quality. And that's important because as you can see in this, this illustration, once we get to a percent impervious cover to about, about at about 25 percent, a lot of times that's a non-recreational supporting and a lot of times once you get beyond that, a non-life supporting ecosystem, um, once you get much higher in impervious cover if nothing is done. And uh, in our urban settings, it's not uncommon in the first ring and in the urban uh, downtown areas to be anywhere from 80 to 45 percent impervious cover. So we've got our work cut out for us. Um, what that means from a rate control is um, when we increase the rate um, uh, of the discharge from our watershed into our stream channels, we see a tremendous uh, erosion potential. So as we're increasing the volume and increasing the rate and dumping it down a natural channel, that channel has to reform itself and, and uh, adjust to the new volumes and rates and the soils lose their ability to, co to, to hold together and a new channel is being formed. What that means is a lot of sediment transport 